Thank you for having me and I'm sorry I'm getting a little bit too much today. That's okay, that's okay. I think we'll not have any of the so uh, we'll, we'll start off, uh, you know, Rohit, we want, we ask this to everybody and I think we'll, we'll start off uh, with the same question. Tell us about your background. Uh, how did you grow up? Uh, what was it back then? Mm -hmm. uh, was the entrepreneur bug still uh, alive when you were a kid? Uh, you belong to a business family. Yeah. Uh, so tell us all about your background, education, college days. Sure. Uh, we love to hear that. I can tell only some parts. All, all will be too much detail, I think. <laughs> But, you know, okay, anyway. the interesting ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you know, I uh, I grew up in a uh, small. I actually didn't grow up in Delhi. Uh, so I grew up in a small town in Punjab, a small town called Malo, which is a population of 60-70 thousand people. And I grew up in a business family, as you mentioned. Uh, I went to the uh, only English medium school uh, that we had in our town. And uh, you know, I think so. My father is in the fertilizer business, so he had a shop uh, that used to sell fertilizers. So after school I'd just go there sometimes uh, and hang out with my father. You know, overall I think as I was growing up, you know, uh, I was getting more and more interested in doing business. Not that people did anything else in those those small towns. The only only things available were either you're doing your own business or you're working in a bank. That's it. And there, there are not really, you know, software engineers, corporates, etc, etc. So I grew up seeing all of that and really, you know, this was very interesting and I wanted to do that. Another interest and you know, the exposure in that town because back then there was hardly any internet, etc, etc. The exposure was very limited. And I remember the only thing that people knew about the outside education world in my town was that you know, if you get good marks in class 10th, you go to DPS. <laughs> That's it. So, our coffee standard tha, that you know, whoever does well in 10th, you go to DPS, then you figure out the rest there. After that, you don't know much. So, that's uh, exactly what I did also. I happened to score decently in class 10. And uh, just as was obvious, as was the tradition of the town, I landed up at DPS Arthur. And I remember, you know, IIT, etc., we'd heard the names, but no, no one really from our town had been to an IIT. And there used to be this interesting fable uh, in our town. This, um, again, looking back to 98, 99, is that people in our town used to think that hey, there is this big uh, institute in Delhi called FITG, uh, which gives a money back guarantee on getting into IIT. Kya <laughs> admission If you don't get into IIT, they'll give you your money back. So that's how primitive our knowledge was. Anyways, I landed up at DPS. Uh, very interesting place uh, for the first time because. You know, growing up in a very small town, you never, you know, you're always under this perception that, you know, while you're doing well in your own school and your own town, uh, when you go to compete at a national level, you may or may not be good. But then, you know, when you came to DPS, one of the good things about that school, you know, is that almost everyone is quite brilliant. And uh, when you look at people around yourself, you know, you start getting the feeling that, hey, if these guys can do it, I'm I also do it. okay. <laughs> Okay, so then I think that's how I started preparing for IIT, got into IIT in Delhi, uh, did my computer science from there. Uh, IIT Delhi years were fun years. Uh, I think I wasted a bunch of time, used a bunch of time uh, in many different ways. But you know, I think uh, Kunal, Kunal and me, both, both of us met each other at uh, DPS. Post DPS, Kunal went to uh, Watt and I went to IIT Delhi, but we used to keep in touch. And one thing which we had, you know, outside of the outside of sharing our passion for food and dirty jokes, we also shared a passion for entrepreneurship. So while, while he was in the US, we used to keep in touch. Uh, I used to do some of his computer science assignments <laughs> also. Uh, so we used to keep discussing that someday we'll start our own business. Uh, both of us graduated 2006. He worked with Microsoft in the US. I worked with Capital One in India. And then, you know, I remember how we ended up starting the company was that, you know, he was back in India, end of 2016, his brother, uh, 2006, uh, his brother was getting married uh, at that time, I remember, and on the sidelines of marriage, we started discussing that, hey, you know, both of us want to start our business someday, and, you know, he asked me, so, what's your plan? I said, kuch nahi, but, you know, I'll work for a few years, go to the US, do an MBA, pay back my loan, come back to India and start a business. And he said, but, you know, why do all of that? Why can't you start right now? So that's an interesting idea. Karna to hai, why not now? So that's I think that's how we really started planning the business. That hey, you know, if we actually have to do it, then you know why go through all this? Right now, 
we have no liabilities, we have nothing to lose, you know, we are decently educated, hopefully we'll get a job. If we don't, and you'll get a wife. Yeah. That wasn't well. too sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that we hadn't thought that through. Okay. Uh, which was a harder thing, which I'll come to later. <laughs> but anyway, so so hence we started discussing some business ideas. And you know, I remember literally the day uh, the marriage got over, both of us, you know, got together, started planning that how do we start a company? And what we actually had no clue what will we start. And we started planning something we sort of, I think in a span of 10 days, we would have trashed, sort of built and then trashed three ideas. And then we finally Do you remember what those three ideas were? Yeah, I remember first we wanted to start a, a reviews website that you know, just anything you can review, internet reviews, etc. So that was number one, idea number one. Second idea was, you know, this is, I'm talking three book my show days, sure. to start a movie ticketing website. And we still have the domain bookings.com. Okay. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think we started discussing some of those, and then we finally realized that you know, uh, couponing was a very interesting business. Money saver. Uh, this was money saver. Uh, this is again, I'm talking early 2007. That no one was doing that in India. Uh, it was a very large space in the US. And you know, when you are 23 year olds, that's pretty much all the data points that you need. The okay, US made it's a large space. No one's doing it in India. Great, billion dollar idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we left our jobs uh, and started the company in 2007, kind of 2007. So, you know, when you started out, um, like you said, you were single, yeah. um, and uh, you had this vision in front of you. Yeah. How hard was it to start out back then? Actually, starting off is very easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've seen that. That's generally the easiest part. Uh, at least for us, maybe because you know we are we are very simple brain people that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that hey, you know let's think of one. We knew that we had to start something. Secondly, we felt that hey, you know we have nothing to lose. I mean, even if it doesn't work out in a few years, that's okay. We're not that poor or hungry. <laughs> I think so. That says there has to be some value in education. Absolutely. Uh, so we felt hey, what's the downside? So let's start something. Uh, what was interesting was right after we started. Uh, because, you know, contrary to what many people believe, uh, we actually started the company end of 2007, which is now almost eight years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when we started off, it had nothing to do with what we do right now. If we just, you know, when we were starting, if someone were to say that, hey, maybe a few years later you'll be running an internet marketing, we'd be like, you know, you seem to be joking. Sure. Uh, so we started off as a coupon booklet company back in 2007. And uh, we thought, you know, the product that we were working on, which is Money Saver, we thought that we were building the most brilliant product that has ever known to mankind. And, and, and that's generally how most entrepreneurs believe. And you were able, able to raise money also for that, right? No, no, nothing. Nothing, okay. Nothing. So we had no, no money. You know, this was all our, whatever minimal savings that we had. I remember it was around 20 lakhs between the two of sure. or something like that. You know, just all the money that we had. We started putting that into the business. And we said that, hey, you know, when we are building a product, we'll build the most world-class product that is ever known to mankind. <laughs> And uh, we took nine months to launch the first version. It was a simple booklet with coupons from restaurants, retailers, etc., etc. We said we want to build the most fantastic product. We'll spend all the time that's required, which is a big mistake in hindsight. Took nine months to launch and launched in June 2008 after nine months of work. And you know, we also we were so convinced that we had built such a fantastic product that we knew that the day we launch, there'll be a queue outside our office <laughs> to, you know, for people to get their hands out of the product. So we wanted That's to That's the entrepreneur dilemma. Absolutely. It is true, you know, and we realized that through, uh, uh, you know, very clear first-hand experience. So, and we also wanted to make sure that we don't run out of booklets to sell because they were so awesome. So, uh, so, we, <laughs> so, so we went ahead and printed 50,000 of them. Wow. <laughs> and you know, the day we launched, I remember uh, after we launched, just when we were about to launch the product, the first thing we started thinking of is that, you know, okay, we built a great product, but we actually never thought how will we sell it. I mean, if someone had to buy it, we actually, we, for some reason, assumed that it will be So, uh, So then we started talking to many different companies, uh, BPOs, etc. And said, you know, why don't you allow us to, you know, put a stall in your cafeteria? We we'll show the product physically to so many people, and you know, people will be interested. So, in the first week of launch, we we would have shown the product cumulatively to probably 10, 12,000 people, and uh, we were obviously very excited. Uh, we sold seven copies, or like five copies, <laughs> is the first one. Day. And suddenly we were like, you know, just we thought we were working on something fantastic, and but no one wanted to buy it. So that was, I would say, shock number one. That you know, and lesson number one for us. 
that you know it's very important to start start launching something very very quickly start talking to real consumers and not the two people right. who are building the product right. because we'll always you know over fantasize how great the product is it's when we show it to real consumers that we get to know whether they like it or not so that that product completely bombed and uh, you know all our money we had spent just on printing the booklets okay. so we somehow figured out a way to you know sell it to you know either a bank or a credit card company etc at least you know they saw some value in it at printing cost sure. not at you know, the price that we wanted to sell so that at least we get the money back uh, which is what we did then we moved to mobile coupons again uh, this is not mobile as we know it today which is smartphones this is text based sms based coupons that started doing very well uh, till the time we were giving free trials so we went from 0 to 10000 users in 3 weeks wow. and then 10000 to 10 in the next day when we said free trial is over <laughs> <laughs> so then we realized also that you know uh, people love to use things that they can't touch and feel they don't want to pay for it right uh, so then you know, that also did work so then we launched a physical card we could carry like it just actually we actually went back in technology because this technology was harder to build that you text us the name of the coupon or name of the store and we'll send you a coupon we went back in technology we sort of launched a dumb piece of plastic you carry it in your wallet you show it at a restaurant you'll get a discount sure that started doing much better right? okay. surprisingly what we earlier thought that the more <laughs> complex things are better we realized that you know at the end of the day consumers feel that you know, okay i'm carrying something i'll show it i'll get a discount and you know this physical thing can have a price sure so that started taking off a little bit but you know even that was the success of that was fairly lukewarm and then I think uh, things really started taking off when we launched Snapdeal in February 2010. Uh, for us, practically what we had done was we were anyways in the coupons and deals business. Yeah. We just took that business online. And uh, when the internet channel was available, suddenly far more people could discover us. And you know, we could change our business far more frequently. So then our business started. So how important was it? Uh, for for an entrepreneur to have a mentor because you know you, from 2006 mm -hmm. to 2000, I just mentioned uh, we, we would have loved to get some advice in probably these four years. There will still be some time which we need to spend. Sure, but you know probably those four years could have been one year, six months, one and a half years, etc., etc. So I, I don't think uh, mentors can help you start a company or build a company. But I think, uh, I definitely feel that they can help you in avoiding some of the basic mistakes that you're going to So that would have been very helpful. And you know, back then, there were very few uh, entrepreneurial companies in India. And uh, while we used to seek advice, but you know, uh, and we used to get advice also, but the number of people we could reach out to was not that many. And I think now the ecosystem is much better, which is very good for everyone. So from a coupon online business yeah. to, you know, one of the largest uh, marketplaces. Mm -hmm. What was that like? I mean, you know, <laughs> is, is pivoting important? Very. Uh, I How many times did you guys pivot? Probably six or seven. Uh, okay. Counting the things that I can talk about. There sure. were many others that we did which we can't even talk about. Okay. But, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I've, I've actually carried this notion in my mind uh, for some time that, you know, sometimes I've seen when companies are too young, they tend to get too attached to their business model than the success of their company. Right. And it's important to you know have a very clear differentiation between the two. What really matters is whether we are able to build a successful enterprise or not. Whether this business model worked or did not, probably doesn't matter. If you actually, on the contrary, uh, look at much larger companies in the world, they are very flexible with pivoting. You know, every company that you know sure. has pivoted. Apple has pivoted. You know, it was something else, and now it's absolutely doing something very different. IBM took the call of just selling off their hardware business, which was their crown jewel and pivoting into something else. Google in itself has pivoted multiple times. They you know, started as search and now you know so many businesses that have been built or Facebook or everyone else that we know. So you know if you think about look around the world, pivoting is very, very common, very, very natural. And I would I would almost argue essential because what you are good at today may actually be irrelevant ten years later. Uh, so I think as a result, you know uh, I think sometimes when the companies are smaller and very early, we tend to end up getting too attached to the business model rather than the success of the company. It's always important to keep keep in mind what users are telling us because at the end of the day, whatever we build, we are not building for ourselves. We are building for people who are going to use it. And if people who are going to use it don't like what we are building, then obviously we need to do something else.
Correct. So, so, so one should know when to say, you know, this is a time for the company to die or maybe pivot. Yeah. And, and should, should realize that. I would say that, you know, the most important thing is to, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just iterate very, very quickly. And, you know, fail or succeed very fast. If something is not working, let's just do it very quickly, realize that it's not working, and then move on to something else. It's as simple as that. So, I mean, you know, uh, there's, there's always a, a, a thin line between choosing entrepreneurship versus mm -hmm. a very pushy job. Yeah. Uh, you know, big pay packets, yeah. a fancy uh, job, or a good title. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, so that's on one side. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure being out of my ID. <laughs> Uh, and I am. Yeah. And on the other side, there's this struggle of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. How do you decide the gap? Uh, Actually, <laughs> I have a one very strong belief uh, about entrepreneurship. I believe that you know, starting a company is like asking a girl out or asking a guy out, okay. whatever it is. Because if you overthink it, you'll never end up doing it. So, <laughs> 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 yes. so uh, if you think you want to do it and you really believe it, just go ahead and start it. Take okay, we'll figure out the rest over a period of time. If you overthink, acha, ye karenge tya, to kya hoga, you know, and then you know, what if, what happens to my existing job, etc., etc. Just you know, there are always too many risks in life. Like you know, the girl can say no, that's fine, that's okay. At least I asked. <laughs> uh, same is the case with entrepreneurship. It may not work, but at least I tried yeah. and I gave it a fair shot. And only then can something happen. And how important are uh, important uh, it is for entrepreneurs to absorb those shocks of setbacks? Very, very important. You know, uh, and give give them some balance at yeah. the same point. So you know, I, I've seen uh, there's this interesting tweet that I saw a few weeks back, which really stuck in my mind. So, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur, your emotional balance is really like a sign curve. You know, I remember the day we started the company, you know, we had all made up our mind, we all moved back from the US, I had an HMB, I said, you know, I won't, won't go to the US and we'll start a company because we thought we were on to something which was absolutely phenomenal and mind-blowing. And literally, I remember 23rd September 2007, we came and we said, okay, leave our jobs, start a business, but then, the first thing that we realized is there are two other companies who are doing the same thing. <laughs> like, okay, that that we didn't do. But you know, I think uh, then what happens is, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, one day you'll be like, you know, I'm on top of the world, I'm launching something fantastic. Absolutely. Next day you'll just absolutely be down in the dumps. Right. And then again, back up the next day. So I think what happens is that you go through this massive emotional fluctuation in yeah. the first few weeks, or first few years. And then over a period of time, you start realizing that this is the way of life. So. Nothing changes in the world, it's just you start changing to realize that this is the natural course of life. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, it will happen. Uh, you know, anyone becoming an entrepreneur who does not get shocked in the first month that, you know, shit, what did I How do? did you take your setback? I think for us, for one did thing... you go scream at the world? <laughs> <laughs> one thing that, uh, you know, one thing I would say that you know, really worked well for us in hindsight is that, you know, uh, and that's what my advice to, you know, I don't know how many people here have already started companies. How many people are thinking of starting companies? Okay, so the, my first part was relevant for people who are overthinking, clearly. So uh, don't think too much, just, just start. But for people who started companies, you know, one thing I would, uh, I, I always would advise and that worked for us also, is that, you know, stick to it for a few years. Uh, after you've started a company, uh, don't always keep thinking that, you know, hey, you know, my job was so much better or every month I'm doing entrepreneurship, I'm losing so much of paycheck, etc, etc. If you start overthinking here, you know, all the things that I could have done, it doesn't really help anyone. It definitely doesn't help the company because half the energy goes into just weighing those options. I would say that, you know, once you're starting a company, we made up our mind very clearly. Three years, we will not even think. Just, you know, We'll keep our expenses very low so that we can survive. Okay. Uh, and just live through it for three years. Whether it works, doesn't work, we do zero sales, build a zero business, it doesn't matter. I would say just, you know, that commitment that I will stick to it for a few years, that that has a lot of value in itself because then only you give yourself a chance of iterating with different business models and arriving at something that works. And, you know, our philosophy when we started the company was, uh, as, as we uh, evolved the company was that, you know, if we keep trying some or the other business model, 
just by law of averages something will work. You know, we can't be that dumb here. We tried 10 things, kuch bhi nahi <laughs> Something has to work. So I think just by law of averages, something will work out if we commit enough. So you guys bootstrap the, the, the company for quite a bit, right? Yes, for uh, uh, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. I mean, we did raise some angel financing, but you know, $100,000. Yeah, so your company <laughs> was growing at the same point of time. Uh, maintaining employees became a challenge. I read this. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, at that time, uh, an entrepreneur should do best with yeah. motivated employees and uh, you know, actually keep them go up and going yeah. when he knows that he can't pay the salaries for the next month. Yeah. So, how do you do that? Sure. Uh, so, you know, I think the, mo the most interesting time, you know, and I think uh, if I look at our entrepreneurial journey, the most defining time personally for our own selves as entrepreneurs was back in 2009. I remember, you know, we had raised some angel money, we had put all our money in and uh, it came to a point where the company was left with like 50, 50 40, 50,000 rupees in the back balance and we had to pay 4 or 5 lakh rupees of salaries the next day. And this was, you know, really uh, the defining moment for us. We had 4 or 5 lakhs in our personal bank accounts but the, and that was it by the way. And the company had only 50,000 rupees. So this was you know, really the moment of truth for us. Uh, we could have said that, hey, you know, just too much has happened and just let me just go back, you know, we'll go get a good job, we'll be okay, etc, etc. Let's just check all of this. Or we could say, which we did, is that, you know, we've done so much, so five lakh rupees ka kya <laughs> you know, Let's just put this also and we'll see, you know, if you're going in, let's just go all in and let's see what happens. We did the latter and we actually, both me and Kunal wrote personal checks uh, for the next month's salary. And uh, you know, I think just that changed something. We were very lucky that we raised a round of financing right after that, right? Oh, so 30 days after that and we could start paying salaries. But that to us, you know, uh, the way I think, you know, entrepreneurship is also a journey of self-realization that, you know, do you really want to do it or do you not want to do it? And that to us told us, yeah, we really, really want to do this and we are willing to go all in then that becomes very important and when people see that happening around yourself in your own company their own commitment sort of goes up significantly because they feel that you know even the founders are you know they are not always weighing 20 <coughs> options and keeping their options open etc etc all of us are all in as a family we just you know we'll try and make the best one so uh, you know back then i'm sure in 2010 the market yeah. or the consumer was not so insightful about e-commerce uh, I yeah. believe so. Mm -hmm. So, did it take a time? Education, educating the consumer, is it important? Right. Uh, and you know, how's how's the process? Uh, sure. About that. <clears throat> sure. So, you know, uh, when we started in 2010, we were a coupon business, and uh, you know, the first thing that people again, when we were selling coupons to people, you know, I think the one thing that we did is every single day. We used to call consumers and ask them, and you know, I remember the day we launched Snapdeal, you know, from that day for almost the first one year, all of us, the entire company, they used to call their friends and ask them here, why don't you buy coupons? And the answers that we used to hear were the most insightful things for our business. I remember day one, I called up a friend of mine and said, you know, you know, why don't you buy this coupon? And this is really, we had launched Snapdeal in 10 days of development, so this is really scrappy half the time which the times it didn't used to work etc etc so he said something very interesting that you know when i go to your website uh, i for some reason think it's a very small thing and you know people will run away with my money that was their concern at that time and because you know we were very small and no one had heard of us so why don't you put a landline number at the top so that people feel that there is an office hai, there is someone sitting not a mobile number but a landline yeah. number so that people feel there is some company behind it so, and that's what we did, you know, literally I got off the phone and said, okay, let's put a landline number on top, right? And we could start seeing that, you know, suddenly people's reactions started changing. A lot of people started calling us on the landline okay. because, you know, if I'm spending money with someone, I want to know that they'll not run away. Right. And anyone can start a website and take my money and run away. So that, that was lesson number one. Uh, lesson number two, he said, you know, I buy this coupon. We used to send coupons by email. That, you know, you buy something, you get the coupon by email and you're done. He said, you know, Unless I check my email, there is such processes over a period of time that everyone has to go and spend some time in the contact center, listen to what customers are really talking about. So that we are very grounded on, you know, what we should be building. So, looking back at your journey today, yeah. uh, one defining moment mm -hmm. 
probably by you would see changed uh, you as a person as yeah. an entrepreneur. What would it be? I would say actually the the day the, the day we hit, hit rock bottom, which I just mentioned to you, I would say that was the most defining time because for us we had hit absolute rock bottom that uh, that day. We had both me and Kunal put together were left with twenty three thousand rupees in our personal bank account. Nothing was left, no savings, no nothing. And you know this was really rock bottom. And there are uh, two ways to look at rock bottom. One is I'm at rock bottom, or you know there's only way up from here. Fortunately, the latter happened, and you know, that just you know also gave us very strong commitment that as long as we continue to stick to what we are doing, good things will happen. So, I'd like to know how things in office. <laughs> uh, things are very good. Yeah. We just uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, you, you guys moved to Gurgaon yeah. to a larger facility. Yeah. How are things in office? Mm. I mean, do you guys sit together, discuss still, or do you guys are busy traveling? Uh, both. How is entrepreneurship after you know a few years? A few years and mm. a value of I think almost five billion. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's still still a lot of fun, and you know uh, I remember uh, early on you know uh, people talk a lot about work-life balance, etc., etc., etc. And uh, you know I remember uh, for some reason I figured this out very early. My parents used to say, "Beta, get good marks in class tenth, then you are set." Uh, and I somehow figured that this doesn't seem right because it seems like a little bit of a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> you get good marks in 10th, then everything is set. Then okay, you get good marks in 12th, then everything is set. Then you get into a good college, then everything will be set. Right. And then get a good job or start a good company or build a good company, etc., etc., etc. So for some reason, I figured this out very early in life that this is not going to stop. You know, it's going to be you know some or the other carrot is carrot or stick is going to be hanging on your neck 